Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the American Library in Paris's virtual evenings with an author series. I'm Catherine Olin, Programs Manager at the American Library. For those of you who don't know about the American Library yet, you know, we've got a lot of uh, attendees coming from the States, actually from all over the world, which is a real treat. And I wanted to take the opportunity to introduce our institution as well, although I'm of course, into doing this from home. Um, so the American Library in Paris is the largest English language lending library on the European continent, something we're very proud of. We are not just a space for books, periodicals, and resources. However, we're also a very lively event space. We do um, events for all ages. So from you know toddlers to teens to adults like this evening, and everything is continuing virtually for the time being so that we can continue to meet safely, but the library is open for lending. I also wanted to mention that we're 100 years old this year, so it's our centennial. We've been finding plenty of creative ways to celebrate our legacy virtually. Um, one of those ways is going to be the Century Gala, which is taking place on October the 8th. And there's still time to purchase a ticket for this virtual event if you're interested in attending, and I invite you to visit our website if you'd like to learn more about that. In general, you can learn more about the library by you know, visiting our website. As I said, we also have a Facebook page, an Instagram page, we're on Twitter, we're sort of everywhere, YouTube channel. Um, and I also invite you to subscribe to our bi-weekly e-newsletter. It's called eLibris, and that will keep you up to date about library Just, news I and events. Go. I'm going to go ahead and mute. All right, here we go. Um, so this evening, I'm delighted to be joined by Mumta Chaudhry and Russell Banks. They'll be speaking about Haunting Paris, a wonderful debut novel from Mumta. Mumta is a real globetrotter. She's living in Florida, but spends Huge. part of... Sorry, I'm going to have to mute you again. Okay, we should be fine. So Mumta, as I said, she lives in Florida, but spends part of each year in India and in France. Uh, before writing, she was working in television and in classical radio. Uh, but her writing projects have appeared previously in newspaper and magazines across the US and India. Uh, she's currently at work on her second novel. Russell is the author of Continental Drift and Cloud Splitter. He is one of America's most celebrated fiction writers and is a past president of the International Parliament of Writers, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and a two-time finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. He splits his time between upstate New York and Florida. And I wanted to mention quickly, he has a novel coming out in March 2021 called Foregone. So maybe he'll, he'll have a word to spare for us about that. But the focus, of course, tonight is Mumta. Um, so Russell, at this time, I'll invite you to, uh, to begin with any questions. Thank you oh, for being here. Good. All right. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Um, should I try to see uh, Mumta's face on this? How can I do that first? So, so I can, any, when she speaks, you'll be able to see her. So. Oh, okay, only that. All <laughs> right, that, that, that makes it a little harder. Um, okay, Mamda, um, it's a pleasure to be with you again, even um, virtually. Um, not as as much fun as it would have been if we could be together in person uh, in Paris um, at the American Library in that lovely little courtyard and the room uh, that they have readings in and and and. In, but a host of events in, uh, where I've had the pleasure of, of reading a couple of times. And then afterwards, Mamta, we could take a walk down along the quay and, and um, the Pont Neuf and, and, uh, and uh, look up at the windows of the apartments. Um, and with, as, as a lead in, can I, can I just t take us there and, and walk along there, uh, the quay with you and let you begin uh, telling us about the book a little bit? Sure, thank you, Russell. It's always a pleasure to talk to you because I feel you make the book sound much more um, wise and intelligent than it actually is. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that's why I invited you to be here in conversation with me. Thank you, Catherine, for that lovely introduction. And it's a dream to be speaking at the American Library in Paris, except in my dream, I was actually there. Thanks to all of you who've come. Merci d'être venu. And Russell and I, obviously, would both like to be there in person, but we're there in spirit, which is one way of haunting Paris. So, you know, Paris is one of those cities which it is very easy to love but very hard to know. And before the first time that I ever went to Paris, I had 
friends, both French and American, tell me that to cross the threshold, c'est difficile. And for me, it seemed more than difficile, it seemed impossible. I'm so clearly an étranger, a foreigner, a stranger, an outsider. And you know, I have to tell you that I didn't start out to write about Paris, and especially not from this perspective. I'm not French, not Jewish, neither man nor ghost. But that was the voice I heard, and I felt compelled to follow it wherever it took me. Um, I think Russell will tell you this too. As a writer, you don't always choose your stories. Sometimes they choose you. And so it was with this story, you know, Russell was talking about um, walking along the quay and looking up at lighted windows. And that's exactly the genesis of this story. One day I was walking down Ile Saint Louis and looking up at the lighted windows as one does in Paris, trying to imagine yourself into a life there. And I heard a drift of music come down from one of the windows. I couldn't see who was playing, but I had this really vivid impression of a man leaning forward, listening very intently. And I kept being fixated by that snatch of music, by that image I couldn't get out of my head. And as you'll see when I read you just a little section of the novel, that um, the man was Julien, who was drawn back to the woman he loved and the place he called home while he lived. The music had summoned him back to this world where he had unfinished business. So Catherine mentioned that um, this is the centennial year of the American Library in Paris and um, it is certainly cause to celebrate. And I know what they did in um, 1989, um, which is the bicentennial of the French Revolution, the American Library carried out its own revolutionary act. They computerized their collection. So in 1989, where this book is set, all Paris is getting ready to celebrate the bicentennial of the seminal moment in French history that gave us those three glorious words. I mean, you see it still anywhere you go in France, chiseled into every public monument and building, liberté, égalité, fraternité. But up in her apartment on Ile Saint-Louis, Sylvie is mourning the loss of Julien, whom she had lost some months ago. And quite by accident, she discovers a letter in his desk. Now, Sylvie knew that Julien's sister and her two daughters perished in the Holocaust. What she didn't know, and this letter revealed, was that Julien believed that one of the children had managed to escape, and he secretly spent years looking for her, trying to track her down. So now Sylvie takes up this quest where he had left off, and she's quite unaware that she's watched over by Julien's ghost. And this quest leads her back to the year 1942, uh, when Paris was under Nazi occupation, and the roundup of the Jews was taking place um, in Paris, and France singularly failed to live up to its own glorious promise of liberté, égalité, fraternité. So this is a love story in which one of the lovers is dead. It's a mystery in which the detective is a pianist who is so shy that her nickname is Sylvie La Timide. It is a historical novel which has very urgent resonances in the present. And it's a ghost story in which the ghost is the least terrifying thing of all. So, you know, because it's called Haunting Paris, because it's narrated by a ghost, I keep getting asked, do you believe in ghosts? 
Do I believe in ghosts? No, of course not. And yet, when you are in Paris, you cannot but be in their company. You walk along the cobblestone streets and you feel their presence and they are particularly thick along the quays of Ile Saint Louis. You know, I could sense their presence and I would look over my shoulder and I want to say, who are you? What draws you back? But they would retreat from the lamplight into shadows and into silence. So I'll just tell you um, briefly that many scenes in the novel take place in and around Notre Dame. And um, in fact, the two islands in the Seine are at the heart of the novel and at the heart of the city I thought I was writing about, Paris, city of art, city of music, city of love. But right behind where Notre Dame's soaring towers reach for the sky, there's a museum that sinks into the earth. It's the museum the memorial to the martyrs of the deportation. And it was at the deportation memorial that I first became aware of the dark shadows underpinning the city of light. So if you've been there, you know this. If you haven't, check it out next time. It is definitely worth going to. But on the ground, there's a bronze circle, which is chiseled with the words, they went to the end of the earth and they did not return. And that became the first line in my book. And my hair stood straight up as I remember the French word for ghost, revenant, one who returns. And I also had the answer to my question, what draws you back? So I'll just read um, very quickly the first page from the book. Um, it's very brief. Um, so here's the book. And let me tell you, um, it is available um, at all your local independent bookstores. I hope you'll continue to support them as they're connecting all of us and libraries too through the magic of books and it's out in paperback. This must be the only thing that has lost weight during these days of lockdown, because I can certainly <laughs> say that's not true for me. So let me just get a sip of water. I'll read this and then um, Russell and I will talk as we tend to do about the book and wherever the conversation takes us. Okay. They call us revenants, those who return. Restless for this world, we pass each other in mute recognition, for to be silent and solitary is our essential condition. But death doesn't end our thirst for a human touch, a human voice calling our name. And so I haunt these familiar caves, this familiar <coughs> river, Music drifts down from Sylvie's window, and I linger until it comes to an end. The scent of lilacs on the breeze stirs dormant phantoms to life, but music is sorcery more potent. Though bound to time's measure, it exists on a plane beyond time, where there is no past and no future. There is only the present, in which the dead revisit this world. Night after night, I wait until the last notes fade away and Sylvie comes to the window at last. I retreat into the shadows as one after another, the beautiful mansions along Quai d'Anjou spring to light, transforming those in the gloom below into a throng of ghosts. Occasionally, a passing figure pauses in a pool of lamplight to light a cigarette or glance at a watch. Squandered time, the most enduring of regrets. In the end, a lifetime is not enough. The heart yearns for more. 
Who can reason with desire? The heart has its reasons that reason cannot know. Thank you. Okay, Russell. Uh, that's lovely, yes. Um, thank you, Mamta, uh, for that lovely introduction to the book and, and, um, and also um, uh, the sample of the, of, the, of the prose. I'm struck again and again. I read the book uh, before it was published in, in galley form, and uh, so that was now, um, it's almost two years ago, it seems. Um, but uh, its voice lingers in my ear, and hearing you read it uh, brings the whole thing back to life for me again. The prose is so beautiful and tender and exact um, uh, that uh, I'm struck over and over again with, with uh, the tone of it is, is, is striking to me, too. I, I think... Um, I compared it to, to um, Patrick um, Modiano. Um, there's a kind of melancholy and lyricism mixed together, which is which is extremely unusual and and and, and perfectly appropriate. You know, there's um, um, something by Samuel Beckett I I have uh, on the wall of my studio uh, where I'm sitting right now, actually. Um, that I use to kind of guide my mind, and um, and your book seems to um, exemplify and dramatize that. Here's the quote. Um, it's it's very simple, uh, from Beckett. He says, um, "There is no escape from yesterday, because yesterday has deformed us, or been deformed by us. Both. Um, your book da dramatizes really how yesterday." 1942, if you will, has deformed us, deforms uh, Julien, deforms Sylvie, deforms all the characters uh, uh, contemporarily in 1989, um, um, as well as dramatizes how yesterday has been deformed by us, uh, by Julien, by Sylvie, by those who have forgotten. Um, by the Americans who arrive at the novel, um, who are very important to the novel's perspective, I think, to have contrast there between Sylvie as an American living in Paris and the French characters and then these two wonderful American characters uh, are present as well uh, to dramatize in uh, how the past has been deformed by us. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a rather specific writerly question. I hope you don't mind. Um, and, that, and that's due to the very careful, very deliberate, uh, and quite complicated structure of a novel. I wanted to know how you came to that and how difficult it was to come to that, because it's, it's, it's quite original. Can you speak Thank to that? Thank you, Russell. Thank you. And you know, you, you, when you talk about the tone and you talk about Modiano, there's certainly that sense that elegiac sense of something that has been lost, deformed, as you put it. But um, I think also it's what William Faulkner once said, you know, um, the past is never dead. It's not even past. And right. how it's so redolent in the story. So as far as the um, way I came to the book, as I said, I followed it just directly from um, the voice. And, you know, for the ghostly thing, let me tell you, uh, Catherine mentioned that I was a radio announcer for classical music. So I would be playing this Schubert and this Chopin, which I wish I could play in life, but I was playing it on, you know, records in the old days and then CDs. And I had this experience of going out into the city disembodied where I entered homes that I would never enter in real life. I was part of lives that I would never be able to imagine otherwise. So I think I felt very um, familiar with the ghost perspective. Mm -hmm. And as far as how it was all brought together, you know, it's almost, I don't know, Russell, I want to ask you this in a second, but when I write, it's like just shooting as many scenes as you can. Mm. And it's in the editing room that it acquires its structure. And so since this is a writerly question and 
um, you know, questions about craft are like catnip to a writer. We are just like right after them. I will say this, that Walter Benjamin, who has written a lot about Paris and the flaneur, which is very important to my um, novel too, he said that a book is always written on three levels. You know, there is the musical level where it is composed, there's the architectural level where it is structured, and there is the textile level where it is woven. Mm -hmm. So I had to think of all three of those when I had this really unwieldy structure going back and forth and to try and put it together. So. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it did not come quickly or automatically. You know, there's, it's interesting. You 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 mentioned film editing and so on. There's a wonderful book uh, uh, by uh, Michael Ondaatje, uh, the novelist, the great Canadian novelist and poet, um, and uh, Walter Murch, the great uh, film editor, uh, edited. Um, Francis Coppola's uh, films and, and, and many, many other f great films. And, and Andace is interviewing um, Walter Murch. And at some point in the, in the text, he realizes that what the process that's being described by a film editor is exactly the same thing that a novelist does in revising and in, and in, and in the second draft, the third, the fourth, the fifth uh, draft and so on. And I'm sure you were working exactly that way. It's interesting you brought uh, film editing into the conversation. Uh, let's talk for a second, if we can, about the ghost, because the ghost is not just a ghost that's uh, lurking. Uh, the ghost is, is, uh, is, to some degree, the narrator, too. Um, um, there are long passages, uh, uh, the, the opening passage that you read, for instance, uh, and, and where the ghost is present, and we depend upon the ghost for the story. Uh, to a considerable degree. I think a, a, a great ghost story is, and this is a great ghost story, is one that allows us to believe in and depend on and, and rely on and have confidence in the ghost. It's not a trickster ghost. It's a truth-telling ghost. I, I think that's a wonderful aspect to the book. Um, thanks. You know, yeah, it's it's not an unreliable narrator. What he tells you, you can trust. Mm -hmm. um, and his perspective, in a way, he's also a stand-in for the omniscient narrator and for the ways in which we tell stories, those of us um, who write them. But he he takes pains to point out that he's not really omniscient. You know, he says my terrain is not the future, but the past. Mm -hmm. And um, he can access times in history that have led to this moment that people who are living the moment cannot. So you mm -hmm. can see that there's a very long, direct thread that connects back to ancient times to mm -hmm. these roundups, you know, which um, an ordinary narrator couldn't have access to that, but he is able to, to um, tap into this world, this other world. Yeah, I mean, he's almost a, a, a meta narrator in a way. And, and um, um, he, he's the author in a way uh, of the novel. He stands between the author, you, and, and, uh, and the story as it's unfolding. Um, I, I love his, uh, and I totally trust his, his presence. Um, can you speak a little bit more about, let's talk a little bit more about Paris and your love for Paris and, uh, and how um, uh, you uh, first saw Paris and how it managed to penetrate uh, your imagination to such a degree that you, your, your first novel ended up being set in Paris and about Paris and its history and its presence. Um, clearly, clearly this is a love letter to Paris. You know, it's it's not a funny Valentine like Woody Allen's Midnight in Paris, but it's um, heartbreaking, layered, and complicated as love can often be. Mm -hmm. So the first time I went to Paris, you know, um, I had never been there, um, and I felt instantly at home. And I'm thinking this is so strange. It's 
unlike in every way from the tropical city where I grew up, which is Calcutta in India, the subtropical one where I now live, which is Miami in the States. But why should it feel so familiar? And my husband, who's American, said, oh, well, maybe you know this from another life. And we laughed because, you know, in India, talk of um, mm -hmm. other lives is as common as remarks here about the weather. But it is true that I felt this sense of, of affinity. And, you know, I, I um, have to confess at this point that this is my first published novel, but it's not the first novel yeah. I wrote. And I have a stack of rejections to prove it. I wrote about India. I wrote about America. And then after getting rejection, you know, all over the place, I said, okay, the heck with this. I'm going to write something light and bright and sparkling. And as you can tell from the first page that that's not exactly how it went, although it does have its funny moments. Mm. You know, uh, the first time I went to Paris was 1985. Um, I had a, my first book was being translated into French and that was what the, the occasion uh, for coming to Paris. But I came, as so many Americans of my generation um, have, uh, came to Paris uh, informed by, my imagination shaped by, uh, really, by um, Hemingway's A Movable Feast. So I saw Paris through a literary lens, really, uh, through an artistic lens. I mean, I, my vision of it had been changed. It's never changed. I mean, it, it's been embellished to a considerable degree and, 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 and expanded. Um, but I still see Paris through the lens of the lost generation in the 1920s. And I even read your book uh, through that same lens. I mean, we can't do much about it. Our, 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 our eyes and our ears and, and our sensibilities, all of them are shaped to such a degree by what we have read and what we have seen. Pictures on the wall, movies we have seen, the movies that I saw when I was in my teens and 20s set in Paris. Um, I still see Paris today um, in black and white. <laughs> and, and I read your book in black and white. It, I mean, it was really quite extraordinary. Well, you know, I think that thing about films is true, that we all, whether we've been to Paris or not, have this really clear picture of the city. Mm -hmm. And part of it is it's so cinematic because it is so beautiful and it has been filmed so much. And, you know, you're talking about black and white and um, you think about the red balloon. But mm -hmm. another movie that was in the back of my mind was um, Wings of Desire by mm. Bing Benders, where there's the world of the living and the world of the dead, and mm. these guardian angels who, who watch over those who are living but cannot you know, do anything to interfere with the um, outcome of events. Mm. But it's interesting, this beautiful, regulated, calm, tranquil life of the angels is in black and white mm -hmm. but when they tumble into real life it suddenly like explodes into color mm -hmm. so i think that's true that that um in a way we have these fixed images in our mind like stills from a film and then you go there and they come to life in this glorious color and you discover your Yeah, there's not much you can do about it. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, <laughs> right. It takes you over. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about the difficulty uh, and, and uh, of, of incorporating into uh, a novel, a narrative, a story about human beings, individual, ind very much individualized and, 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 and seen um, in a subjective way. Um, the difficulty of, of contextualizing historically uh, lives like that in a work of fiction is, is extreme. And, uh, and I'd like to have you discuss that a little bit because uh, I've tried it myself and it, it's not easy. Uh, you want, you're not a historian, you're not a journalist, um, you're not an anthropologist, and yet you're going to um, build your story out of historical reality, day-to-day -day journalistic reality, um, anthropological and social scientific realities. Um, yet, and, then, and your novel is, is, is very much built out of those, um, of those realities. And yet it remains um, a story about a woman 
um, and a man and a love affair and a family, an extended family. Um, can you speak a little about that, about the difficulties of it, your awareness of it? Yeah, you know, for me, the uh, you were writing about Cloud Splitter and American history and, and, and seminal moments in American history. I was writing about a time and a place that were not mine. Um, I will say that I might look like the world's oldest debutante, but I was not around in 1942 and certainly not in Paris. But to do the research, to get it right, you know, when it's especially when it's something that is not um, something you have inhaled or by osmosis, you know, mm -hmm. I was very, very paranoid that I would get some detail wrong or somebody in Paris would come to me and say, but Madame, you have put this building in the wrong arrondissement because mm -hmm. I'm sure you all know that if you get something wrong about Paris, that there'll be a Parisian who will be very happy to tell you exactly what you got wrong. So it hasn't right. happened yet, but I'm sure it will. But if I had the, um, if I wanted to get that right, imagine the moral imperative to get right the story when it involved such um, a weighty event in mm -hmm. our history, you know. Mm -hmm. So I did so much research. In fact, I don't know about you, Russell, but um, research is a labyrinth that writers love because we can keep going down into it and think, well, it's almost like writing. I'm, I'm actually almost right. writing. But at <laughs> some point, <laughs> you have to stop and you have to say, okay, so I did all this research and then I put it all aside because this was not a historical recounting of those terrible days where you read what happened to other people. Mm -hmm. This was, I wanted you to feel what it would be like to hear boots on the stairs yourself, to care for someone so deeply that even when they die, you cannot let each other go. So the mm -hmm. love story and the horror make it a lived experience rather than you know one that's researched or snatched from from other accounts. Yeah, no, it has to it has to be rooted in the subjective interior life of your of your characters. That's what fiction does better than any other art form, I believe, is 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 uh, dramatized for us the interior subjective life of an individual human being whom we otherwise would never know. And, and it's not the, not necessarily, and, and should perhaps never be, the interior life of the author as well. Yeah, good. Right. Yeah. Although, you know, when, when people say, here's, this is a big debate, I'm, I'm sure everybody's aware of it, about um, who gets to tell which kinds of stories. Mm -hmm. You know, this is like, um, Zadie Smith says this, this dictum about write what you know has now become like a threat. Stay in yeah. your lane. Like mm -hmm. if all of us stayed in our own lane, um, you'd get some really terrible books lived, mm -hmm. you know, through, through lived experience, but you get some wonderful books through the portals of imagination and empathy. You know, why mm -hmm. would we give an imagination if we can't use it? Why were we given empathy except to open up these unknown worlds? Right. So I think that's, that's um, you, you know, something to consider, not what story you tell, but how you tell it. Are the people you're writing about, would they feel you've done it justice? And I think yeah, that's you, the... Um, right. You've got to have done your homework, that's all. And you've got to acknowledge to yourself at the beginning uh, what you don't know, whose life, whose interior life you don't know, and then you've got to do the work to come to know it in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, and that takes time and, and, and energy and, and a certain humility um, uh, to admit that you don't know. I mean, I, I, I've written um, at length uh, from the point of view of, of women um, uh, in different books, uh, and uh, the truth of the matter is, I, I don't know, and I had to admit this to myself when I began uh, a book like uh, American Darling, for instance, um, I don't know um, what women say to each other when there's no man present. 
I've never been in that room. That's not a room I've ever been in when there was no man present. I do know, however, just out of uh, imagination and experience that whatever they say to each other when there's no man present is different from what they say when there is a man present. They change, just as men, when there's no woman present, change what they say too. And just as whites, white people say differently when there's a black person present, and black people say different, speak differently when there's, a, when there's a white person present, and when there's no white person present. So it's, it's a, that's the kind of humility you have to have as an author to admit to yourself what you don't know, what rooms you have never been in, you've never been allowed to, or you've never ventured uh, into. And then you have to begin to, um, to try to imagine it and take the chances that you're wrong. Right. And it's exactly what it's exactly what, you know, I was saying about uh, French saying to cross the threshold. Right. Right. C'est difficile. But franchir le say to cross the threshold is also an act of not physical entree, but also imaginative um, entrance into another world. And I think that you're so right about um, things that you may not know. And so you talk about how people speak. To me, um, as a writer, and everybody is different when writing, you know, you, you would think that with all the books out in the world that some people might have a template they follow, but every um, writer is nutty in their own way. So um, I think one of the things that for me is very important, in fact, crucial, I don't so much see the person you know, you'll, you'll notice in my book, there's not a lot of physical description mm -hmm. of people of Ana Carvalho, the, the um, uh, Portuguese concierge, or, or of anyone. But I hear the voices so clearly mm -hmm. that if you hear them, you should be able to tell, oh, that's Will talking, the American. That's Alice's mm -hmm. wife. That's Coco the dog. That's the judge up in the upstairs apartment. So I love that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, let me just interrupt a second, though, just to point out the minor characters in this in this novel are really wonderful. Uh, they're, they're fully realized, uh, even though they might make a brief appearance or only for a chapter or two, but uh, and then and then fade. Um, they're integral to the story, but but they have such. Uh, uh, rounded uh, lives, and they're so present and, 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 uh, and, and vivid, and, and 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 I must say, lovable. The Americans, the judge, um, Coco the dog, <laughs> yes, uh, that that's quite an achievement, I must say. Uh, you know, speaking of of, of, of you, you don't see visualize the characters so much as you hear them. Uh, I'd like to. Uh, Apropos of that quote, again, Michael Andachi, who I know is also a friend of yours as well as of mine, but uh, after uh, the English patient was made and came out, uh, he was asked by a journalist, uh, no, he was asked by one of the actors, Willem Dafoe, uh, uh, um, that uh, he said, how does it feel um, to see me, Willem Dafoe, uh, uh, in your uh, wearing your character's clothing and saying your character's lines. Uh, do I look anything like your character? And Michael said, you know, I don't know what my characters look like because I'm always inside them looking out. Wow. And I thought that I was brilliant. That. That was <laughs> yeah. br that's a brilliant truth. Yeah. yeah. And any more than you know what you yourself look like. You've never been in a room with yourself. So you've never been able to see. You're always inside looking out. And, uh, and that's, I think it's true for a fiction writer. Right, and for fiction readers, you know, this is, this is one thing that I know from my childhood. Um, when I read Little Women, um, I had this very clear picture of Joe, of all, all four sisters. Mm -hmm. So the first time I saw the movie, I was like, no way, I imagined it much better. And yeah. I think readers have this capacity to imagine um, characters, if you give them clues and you give them hints, you don't yeah. have to sit there and say how tall they are, how short, you know, you no, don't no, no. need like a, a mug shot, really. Yeah, and yet, you know, I, I that's the, one of the great um, thrills of fiction is that the reader gets to play a creative part in the actual 
um, text uh, by infusing it with the reader's visions and the reader's dreams and fantasies and experiences. Uh, when I read your novel, I mean, I, I, yeah, I see my Paris uh, through your eyes, but I, I, I nonetheless project onto it my memories of Paris and, and uh, my, um, my sense uh, of its sounds and its, and its uh, appearance and its feelings. Um, and that's true for each of the characters as well. Uh, reading is a, cre a creative act itself. Yeah, and you know, um, to talking about um, superimposing memories on it, in these days of um, isolation, when we're all sort of um, put back on ourselves much more than um, during normal times, whatever that is anymore, uh, one of the things we find is how strange time is, you know, that it sort of blurs and um, melts into each other. You know, the Dali clocks, that painting of the clocks that are <laughs> melting. It, it seems like a metaphor for our time. Mm -hmm. But also the name of that painting is the persistence of memory. So if even if you don't know what day of the week it is as you're going through this blurred life, the memory of what the, the passing of time conveys is very much part of our experience now. And it's very much, it's very much a central subject of the book itself is yeah. how we view um, time passing, memory passing. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, we reached a point where I think we we should be taking questions. Is that Absolutely. true? Yes. Thank you both for that wonderful conversation. Okay. We'll give you a silent round of applause. Thank you. All right. No. Yeah. And yeah. Compliments to to Mount also. Absolutely. Thank you, Russell. I can't wait to read Russell's new book coming out um, in March. Um, mm -hmm. It's set partly in the U.S. and partly in Canada, um, mm -hmm. and. I, I don't know what the name is in French. I know in English you said it's foregone. So do you know right. the tra translation yet? Uh, no, not uh, my uh, my translator Pierre Ferlin is now going writing me back and forth uh, as he's trying to unravel some of the sentences and some of the references and so on. And we haven't settled on a French title yet. Well, I'll tell you something. With the same interesting. A, Go ahead. Yeah, what? Um, something interesting about this book, although I must say nobody is clamoring to translate it into any language, let alone French. But in talking to friends, several of whom are in the audience today who are French, we were trying to figure out how you would translate this into French, because in English it has a double meaning, you know, that mm -hmm. Paris is being haunted, but is also a haunting city. You can't say that in one phrase in French, so, <laughs> I <know>. so <laughs> it's hard to figure out. Okay. Right. All right. So, great. Well, so we get we'll questions now? Yes, absolutely. So yeah, I'll, I'll read some of these aloud. Um, if anybody does have any questions, I'm getting a few already, but feel free to submit to the chat box and we'll get through as many as we can. Okay, so I have some coming in privately as well. I'll try to go kind of in order here. Um, Christine is saying, okay, it's a wonderful book, Mamta. I wondered whether you were influenced by traditional Indian ghost stories. What an interesting question. You know, um, ghost stories are part of, of um, Indian childhoods. You know, I, I don't know if it's the thing to scare us to sleep, but you know, even the grim fairy tales, I mean, everything that, that we read to children when they are young probably, you know, uh, mars them for life. But no, I did not specifically have that tradition in mind because I left both the Indian and the American traditions behind. I was just going into the story and into this world. So um, it wasn't so much that, but it was very much of the ways in which history continues to haunt us. And, you know, just even now in today's age, it's more important than ever to know that that ghost is sort of an unrelenting ghost. You ignore it and it will be back in your life with a vengeance. And, you know, Julien, sorry, um, you got me carried away on this. Julien is actually, um, 
a psychoanalyst. So one of the things that he's very interested in is repression and the return of the repressed, which in a way is what all ghosts are, things that we don't want to confront mm -hmm. and they come back to confront us. All right, thank you. Um, the next is from Judy, who's asking, you know, with all the research you most assuredly did, was there anything that you learned but could not use in the writing of the book? Oh, honey, I have, <laughs> I have notebooks full of stuff that I thought, oh, this is fascinating. I've got to work it in. And I did try, but you know, the demands of the story, the story has its own exigencies. It will not allow you to bring in something just for you to show off that you actually know this. So one of the things that I originally started out with, Judy, to answer your question directly, is researching the Roman occupation of Paris. And if Russell thinks the structure is complicated now, I was trying to do Roman occupation, Nazi occupation, you know, trying to draw the, the, the parallels between them. And my editor just went, it was guillotined right away. She said that is, you know, not adding to the story. And she was right. Um, but the only thing that remained from all that research, which was dealing with the Emperor Julian, is the name of my ghost, Julian. So it left its trace. Still haunting the book, I see. Yes, quite. So the next question is from Sarah, who's wondering uh, what you're working on next. Uh, you know, I mentioned the second novel in the beginning here. Um, she also says, Paris no doubt holds many stories for you, but do, other, do you have other special cities as well? Um, I do. I mean, the three cities that are very known to me and very dear to me may seem on the surface to be very different. Um, Calcutta, Miami, Paris. But I'll tell you, they all have something in common. One is they have legendary rivers. The other is they are all book cities. You know, Miami has the Miami Book Fair, Calcutta has its book stalls and book fairs, and Paris, of course, you cannot go one block without running into a bookstore or a bookiniste. So the stories are very um, embodied in all three cities. But as to the next story, you know, um, I am trying to work on something and every writer I know says, oh, all this unexpected time, this luxury, I will just sit down and write, you know, King Lear. And I'm thinking, I'll be grateful if I'm just not as mad as King Lear by the end of this. <laughs> so I'm writing, but I'm trying to find out where the story is going. I won't know till it's done if that was the real story of I had false starts to where I was um, intending to go. All right, the next question is from Clydette, who says, what surprised you as you were doing, uh, doing the research and the writing for this book? Well, Clydette is a very uh, perceptive reader and um, there were a lot of surprises along the way for me. Um, one of them was, um, that in Paris, there is an entire cemetery for those who are decapitated. So that just tells you how important the guillotine was in public life. And, um, you know, it's just a passing reference in my book. A couple of other things, and those actually, um, I think Judy was asking this too, did actually make it into the book, were things that we hold to be just so quintessentially Parisian and French, like the croissant, for instance, or the can-can. Well, read the book to see that how we have mistaken assumptions and the reality comes as a surprise. Okay, the next question is a bit more general, but this is actually perfect. So doing these events virtually and all the way through confinement, we sort of began a tradition of asking authors, you know, what are you reading now? Or if they had any reading suggestions, because that's what we were all doing. A lot of us were getting through confinement by reading, of course. So um, this question is, you know, what's your favorite book and who's your favorite author? Why not? <laughs> Russell, you want to go first? Oh, it's impossible to name one. Um, 
uh, one author or and, and even more difficult to name one book. I'm right now um, rereading William Faulkner, uh, whom I read uh, in my late teens, early 20s, when Faulkner was still alive. Um, I was in... Um, Actually, I was in Miami uh, when I started reading Faulkner as a, as a, a teenager. And um, what's extraordinary is that um, in the intervening 60 years, um, Faulkner has changed dramatically. He's not the same Faulkner he was when I, when I was reading him when I was 20, which means I've changed um, at the same time um, over those same years. And so it's, it's, I find rereading at uh, this time in my life, books, writers whom I loved and had such an impact on me when I was young um, has, um, has been extremely gratifying and important because it's allowed me to take the measure of my own changes over those years, something that's very difficult to do uh, when you don't have a, uh, a, any, um, anything to measure yourself against. Um, and, and so I'm rereading now in these, in these years the books and the writers that I, that I loved. Okay, so I'll say about writers I love, obviously, Russell Banks, so we will not even go there. But um, it's funny, Russell, you say that about rereading, you know, they say this is the year of rest and relaxation, according to Otessa Moshfeg's book. But for me, it's the year of unrest and, and the opposite of whatever relaxation agitation. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah, unrest and agitation. So mm -hmm. In rereading, um, I find a lot of comfort in books that have stood through all these times. And um, I'll tell you two that are related to France and one that is related to the whole world, which is Shakespeare. You know, I find myself turning to Shakespeare a lot as a measure of not how I've changed, but how the world has needed that that eternal verity that you find in his plays. I love the the um, tragedies and I like the comedies, but it's now the histories that just oh. compel me to read. And mm -hmm. the French books. Oh, so I'm I'm completely bathing in this wash of books. But um, apart from the Simenon, which I read just for that tight compression and to get a sense of how. Um, intensely you can have in a hundred pages like in a book called the train he gets a whole life compressed the two books i'm reading are both by outsiders to paris and i think that they have done more to form our um vision of paris than many writers one is mavis gallant um mm. who left canada to go to to paris to write and now i'm reading um giovanni's room Really oh, I love um, both those writers and both those books too. I edited, in fact, a collection of, of Mavis Gallant's stories um, for the uh, New York Review of Books um, uh, publications. Uh, her her Montreal stories, um, the ones that are set in Montreal, and Andache edited her Paris stories uh, for the same series. Mm -hmm. Two two great books. Uh, she's just uh, was. Uh, one of my very favorite writers in the world. One of my very favorite people in the world too. I, I loved her. Okay. All right, well, thank you both so much. I think that's all the time we have for audience questions, but thank you also to everybody who's joining us for your wonderful questions and for your engagement. Um, of course, Mumta, I should say that uh, Penelope at the Red Wheelbarrow is carrying this book as well. So anybody who's local in Paris, um, feel free to stop by the Red Wheelbarrow, who is traditionally our book selling partner when, you know, when at the American Library we're doing uh, book signings, which we would have loved to have done, but in this case, alas, it'll have to be have to be another time for your second novel, Mamta. Um, we'll do it for, we'll do it for Russell's book, okay? Well, for, fly there that's great. For that's his great. Book, okay. If he can make it to Paris, we'd be very happy to host him in March. Yes, absolutely. Um, so thank you again for being here. Um, I did want to close by just saying a couple more words about the library. Um, I think I forgot to mention at the beginning, actually, that we are a nonprofit. So we're completely independent. We are not 
we don't have funding from either the US or the French governments. Um, we rely on our generous donors and on our community quite a bit and we're very grateful for their support. Um, it is possible to make a donation tonight if you'd like to do that. I included a link um, in my email that went out with the Zoom link. So traditionally when we welcome everybody in person, we suggest about 10 euros, but whatever you're comfortable with and whatever currency, I think US dollars is totally fine as well. Um, so. We will continue, of course, with these virtual events through the end of the year. Um, the calendar of events is posted sort of through mid-October for now. And I wanted to wrap up by highlighting just one event um, for people who really like to read fiction. I'll be hosting um, Kirsten Cheng, who, who has written uh, Bury What We Cannot Take. It's her second novel. Um, it's set in early Maoist China. And if you'd like to find out more, or potentially attend this event, it'll be on the 30th of September. And, please head to our website and find out more. So thank you everybody again for joining us. Thank you, Mamta. Thank you, Russell, so much. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you, Catherine. You. Thank, thank you, Mamta. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Bye.